when you compare the different healthcare systems, um, you've traveled to Europe and you've traveled to Japan. And um, I like the one where you say, uh, like in Taiwan, they have a, um, uh, everyone has like a card and on that card is their entire patient history. Yeah. And the doctor's visit is uh, 15 or $20. And they pretty much get, uh, they have one of the major things was they had like a fixed cost. So every um, procedure, every um, issue, you can only charge so much. That was one way to keep um, healthcare costs low. Do you yeah. think that those uh, ideas or systems can be adopted in any way in um, the American system? Yeah, well, here's what happened. You know, I, I'm, I'm American. We lived in America. I had my family of five. We had decent, what we thought was decent health insurance, mostly paid for by the Washington Post company. Um, and we were accustomed to what it was like going to the doctor in the United States. One of my daughters, my daughter Willa Reed, when she was young, constantly had otitis media. That means earaches. It means an ear infection. Uh, pretty regularly, and we would go to the pediatrician, and he would say, yeah, I ear infection, I'll give her a shot of penicillin, and it would go away. It was good care, and that visit, even when Willow was young, this is the 1980s, uh, cost about, about 120 bucks uh, in America to get that treatment, and then we moved to Japan, where everybody gets health care, everybody's covered, and the care is good, and, and uh, Willa, of course, got an earache pretty quickly, and so we went to the doctor's office. It looked like a doctor's office in the United States. There was a waiting room. They were very kind to us. You know, they're very polite to everybody, even my daughter. They called Miss Reed, you know. She was nine years old or something, and um, doctor looked in her ear and said, she's got an ear infection. I'll give her a shot of penicillin, exactly the same treatment in a fine facility, and then we got the bill and it was 480 yen, $4.60 for a treatment that cost 120 bucks in America. And that's really when I started thinking, boy, there are better ways. There are ways to provide healthcare that work. I mean, in the United States at that time, we probably had 35 million people with no health insurance at all. Today, it's about 31 million Americans with no health insurance. Um, and I, I started thinking, gee, there, there are better ways to provide this essential service to care for people's health. Um, then we moved to Britain, where everybody is covered by the National Health Service. You never, nobody ever gets a bill, no matter what happens in the doctor's office or the hospital. I mean, you pay. They pay through high taxes. The sales tax on anything you buy today in Britain is 20%. Um, so you pay, but you don't pay at the point of service. You never get a doctor bill. And the care was great. The care was great. And, and uh, we had to take one of my children to an emergency room once, to an emergency room, and uh, they call it the casualty ward. And we went into this hospital, St. Mary's Hospital. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's right next to Paddington Station, you know, where Paddington Bear lives mm -hmm. uh, on Parade Street. And... Uh, we pulled up in a black cab at this hospital with my sick daughter going to the, you know, going to the casualty ward. And I mean, it's an old Dickensian pile. It's probably 180 years old. It's this dirty red brick. It was not promising at all. And uh, we walked up to the door of St. Mary's Hospital. And right next to the door, there's this gold plaque. And it says, in this hospital in 1913, Sir Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. <laughs> that made us feel a little better about St. Mary's Hospital. And anyway, we made our way back to the casualty ward, and uh, uh, the the head nurse, who's known as Matron in Britain, Matron took control. She took my figured out which of my kids was sick and took her in to see the doctor. And 15, 20 minutes later, my daughter came back, kind of smiling. They had treated her. They had figured out the problem and treated her. Uh, you know, and as a parent, uh, I just felt great about it. I mean, my daughter got the head of health care she needed and very good care. So I went over to Matron's desk and pulled out my checkbook 
And she said to me, no, 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 no. You, you may put away your check. You may put away your check. We do it differently here. Uh, yeah, you don't pay. You pay mm-hmm. through taxes, but you never get a bill. They treat everybody. Everybody gets really good care in Britain, I think, and with, with, with no bills. And the result is, this is a system that works pretty well. Uh, the Brits cover everybody. They have somewhat better health statistics than the United States. They have longer life expectancy than we do. They have generally better recovery rates from disease or injury than we do. Uh, and they spend about 44% as much per capita as we do in a system that covers everybody. Uh, and I began to think, gee, yeah, there are other ways to provide health care. And that's why I decided to write this book. I, I, I thought this was a brilliant idea. I went to my editor, Ann Godoff, who's the president of Penguin Publishing, Random House, Penguin Random House. And I said, Ann, I have, you know, she had published several of my books and some of them sold. Many of them, as I said, didn't sell at all. Uh, I think they were good books, even if they didn't sell. But anyway, some of them had had been bestsellers. And so I said, Ann, I got a great idea. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go around the world and go to the doctor and see how much it costs and how long I have to wait and who pays and how good the care is and see what we Americans could learn from that. And Ann got off, you know, she's my editor and she's a big supporter of mine. She said, well, yeah, I could do that book. We could do that book. But the problem is it's about health policy and books on health policy. They never sell. They never sell. But, you know, my last book for her had been a bestseller. And so she and, and you know, she she's a supportive editor. So she said, yeah, go ahead, do the book. It cost her a lot of money because she had to send me around the world to do all the research. And the book came out, and by good fortune, it came out at a time when we were debating Obamacare, when Americans were really interested in the state of our healthcare system relative to other countries. And uh, God, Ann Godoff called me one day and said, guess what, the first week, I mean, the book had been out about five days, and she said, you're number six on the New York Times bestseller list already. It was phenomenal in the first week, we were just amazed. Uh, I felt great about it. And then Ann said, boy, I'm so glad I thought of this. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I thought of it, but uh, she pays the bill. So I said, yeah, Ann, great idea. Yeah, great idea. But um, so that book did very well because it turns out around just in the last 20 years or so, it used to be that Americans always thought, I certainly grew up thinking America had the best health care system in the world. We all believe that. And I think now in the 21st century, almost all Americans realize that we don't, that we pay more and get less than other rich countries in our healthcare system. We could learn to do it better. And that's the argument of my book. If we wanted to study something from these other advanced democracies, we could provide decent healthcare for everybody at much lower cost. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, uh, a lot of the other countries they view healthcare as a human right. So they do everything they can to prioritize the health of their citizens. Yeah. Um, when it comes to, um, for example, recently the uh, Affordable Care Act that was passed, I mean, over a decade ago, yeah. um, do, do you think that's a positive um, uh, f- like step in terms of US healthcare when, it, when you compare it to other healthcare systems? And, um, and yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to know. Yeah, well, I, I'd say Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, um, it, it, it improved things. It got health insurance for about 18 to 20 million Americans who didn't have it before. Uh, it provided for a hell of a lot of people who were just sick and couldn't go to the doctor. It gave them a chance to get the care they needed. But no, it's not the answer. Obamacare is not the solution. Um, and it hasn't made our healthcare system as good as that in France, Germany, Japan, South Korea, Britain, uh, Spain, uh, Sweden. Uh, no, we're still, we still lag behind those other countries. We pay more and get less. Um, as to whether you asked whether healthcare is a human right, I would say, yeah, in the other advanced democracies, East or West, they would say everybody has a right to healthcare. It's a basic human right. 
it's interesting in America, we have a lot of guaranteed rights. You have a right to vote if you're over 18. They can't take that away from you. Every kid in America has a right to a free public education. No, no city or state can say, go away, you can't come to school. You have a right to that. If you're charged with a crime, you have a right to a fair judge and a lawyer if you need it. We, we, have, we guarantee a lot of rights, but for some reason, Americans have never guaranteed a right to health care, and our country has never provided health care for everybody. Um, which is reflected in the statistics. This is one of the reasons during this COVID crisis that the United States, for all its enormous research capacity and our brilliant doctors and great hospitals, we lead the world both in cases and deaths, the world's richest country, and we've had one of the worst uh, experiences of dealing with this disease, and I believe that too is a function of a healthcare system where we've just never committed to cover everybody. So should we go to Americans and say, hey, healthcare is a human right, damn it, let's get this done? I think not. And the reason is I have gone around the United States giving lectures and said that healthcare is a human right. And I'll tell you what happens, including in Tennessee, where you live, Mr. Casa. Um, people say, oh my God, human rights, we have enough human rights already. The, uh, Another another right, we got to give more rights to people. It's just a way for them to dig into my pocket and take my money. People really, many Americans really resent the idea of saying there's a human right to something. And yet, if you turn the idea around, if you turn it around and say the same thing backward, they agree. So I don't say everybody has a right to health care when they need it. What I say is, as a society, as a rich, advanced society, we have an obligation to provide health care to anybody who needs it. If somebody in my neighborhood is sick or injured or lame, can't go to work, can't go to school, doggone it, I have an obligation to provide care so that they can have a healthy, happy life opportunity. Um, when you put it that way, we have an obligation to provide care to our neighbors all Americans agree with that. I mean, it, when the Pew when the Pew uh, Foundation polls on this, 97, 98 percent of Americans say, "Yeah, we have an obligation to make sure that everyone in our community can see a doctor when she's sick." But only somewhere in the 70 percent say everybody has a right to health care. So I never put it that way. I don't put it there's a right to health care. I just say the same thing backward. We have an obligation to care for our neighbors. Um, and I sometimes put it in biblical terms. Uh, you know, in the 25th chapter of Matthew's gospel, the Jesus' disciples say to Jesus Christ, gee, how can we get to heaven? What does it take to be a good person and get into heaven? And Christ gives one of his incredibly fascinating answers. Uh, they say, what does it take to be a good person? And Jesus answers this way. He says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was out in the street, you took me in and gave me shelter. And when I was sick, you came and treated me. So that suggests to me that, uh, you know, the Christian religion sees health care as a basic right. Um, but as I say, I find it more effective to say it's our obligation to care for others than to say they have a right to demand health care from you. Mm -hmm. um, the next question I wanted to ask was um, when you compare, um, for example, universal health care in Canada and European countries, um, for the patient or patients, they find it very um, it's very helpful for them. But in terms of, in the perspective of the healthcare worker, a lot of people are often uh, overworked and underpaid and um, they face issues. And I think um, recently in the UK, there've been um, strikes by some of the healthcare workers that, that about, about these issues. But, um, when it comes to America, you have um, privatization of healthcare where um, a lot of companies are looking for uh, the, uh, the, um, as much profit. The healthcare is treated as a business and they're looking as, for 
how much uh, business they can or make a profit they can make. Is there a middle ground of what the best system is? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Should medicine be for profit? Uh, and the answer I found in um, several countries, well, for example, in Great Britain, as I said, no, it's a nonprofit. It's a government operation. The doctors, most doctors work for the government. The hospitals are owned by the government. It doesn't make a profit. But um, in many countries, the providers of healthcare, that is the doctors, the dentists, the chiropractors, the therapists, and the hospitals are private businesses. But the payment system is government. The insurance plan is government or in in uh, in in the German model, the there are private insurance companies, but they're charities. They they don't make a profit. If they make a profit, they have to give it back to the government at the end of the year. Uh, they act as charities, <clears throat> and I think that's not a bad blend. I think that's a pretty good answer. The providers, as long as there's some competition, uh, the doctors and hospitals and drug companies can operate for profit. Uh, but the payment scheme, the insurers should be nonprofit. Uh, the United States is the only country in the world where basic health insurance is a for-profit operation. And the reason I say that is there's a fundamental conflict. There's a basic conflict between providing health care for an insurance company. There's a basic conflict between making a profit and providing care, uh, paying for the care of your uh, customers. The way you make money, uh, make a profit in health insurance is by collecting a lot of premiums, but not paying a lot of bills. And that's what health insurance companies do. They find ways not to pay your bill. How do they do that? Well, they have these very high deductibles. I mean, people uh, right here in Denver, I was just trying to help a local couple, uh, just a couple, two people, look for private health insurance and the cheapest plan they could find cost $650 a month with a $6,200 deductible, which means to say they'll go all year and never collect a penny from the insurance company. And that's how the insurance company makes a profit. So in other countries, they say health insurance, we need it. We need somebody to help people pay the bills, but it can't operate for profit because then they don't help. And of course, you see what happens in America. People get health insurance. There's a $6,000 deductible, which means they pay the first $6,000 of doctor bills. And the result is they don't go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. They get a bad cough. They get a pain in their side. They get they start limping. They, they get some ailment that could be treated pretty easily if they could go to the doctor, but they don't go because the, the visit is not going to be covered by insurance. And of course, what happens is over time, that ailment gets worse and worse, and eventually they end up in the emergency room at some huge cost. So if people felt that they could go to the doctor <clears throat> at the first couple of coughs or the first fever, um, we, we'd have much better health outcomes. People would be healthier in our country, but they don't go because the high deductibles and in insurance, and that's a function of insurance companies having to pay uh, profit. I just noticed in yesterday's paper, the uh, the uh, chairman of United Healthcare, which is the biggest private health insurer, just retired. And guess what? They gave him uh, a golden parachute when he left, $66 million. That's your insurance premium work. You're paying that guy $60 million. Basically, Gosh. it's after you. So, I think we should, people need health insurance to pay the bill, but it should be nonprofit. And that's the system in all the other countries. It's only the United States that allows um, uh, insurance companies to be for profit. But the doctors, the dentists, the labs, the hospitals, uh, they, they can operate for profit as long as there's some competition. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, um, even in, um, Different part, different hospitals. You have certain for-profit hospitals, certain non-for-profit hospitals, certain clinics. Almost every where you go, there's a different price. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what do you think 
in order to increase transparency, do you think there should be a set price for certain procedures or certain um, healthcare services? Or do you think as a, as a patient or a customer, we should know what we're go like, uh, going to pay if we have like a certain condition? Or um, uh, with regards to transparency, how, how do we improve that in the healthcare system? Yes, I, I, uh, I think the answer is yes to both those questions. Um, prices should be transparent. You should be able to say to the doctor or hospital, well, if you replace my hip, what's it going to cost? And the mm -hmm. hospital's going to say, well, every patient's different. We don't quite know the complications. We can't read the MRI that clearly. But they should be able to give you a range of what that's going to cost. Um, as I say in my book, interestingly, in France, when you go to a doctor in France, you know what you're going to pay. And the reason is they're required by law to list on the wall the 100 most common procedures in that doctor's office, how much it's going to cost and how much of it insurance is going to pay for you. So you know before you ever walk in that mm -hmm. this visit is going to cost me 25 euros or something. Um, in America, you can't possibly know that because the docs, the labs, the hospitals don't want you to know. They want to keep it secret and then gouge you for as much as they can. Uh, I learned healthcare from the great, great healthcare economist, Uwe Reinhardt. Um, and Uwe always said the uh, the pricing system at American hospitals, maybe we ought to maybe we ought to let retail stores have the same system as hospitals. So here's how it would be. You go into the department store to buy a new dress and uh, you look at the dresses and you see one you like and you say, oh, I like that one, how much does it cost? And they say, oh, uh, uh, well, well you'll, you'll find out later. And then three months later, you get a bill and the, the dress cost you $8,000, which they didn't mention. That's how hospital pricing works in America. So yes, uh, medical prices should be, um, should be tr transparent. We should require them to tell you at least a range. Mm -hmm. And guess what? We can do that. We can do that in the United States because the biggest insurer in the United States already does that. That's Medicare. Mm -hmm. That's the government program for old elderly people and the disabled. And Medicare sets fees for every procedure. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the hospital may try to charge more, but they can't get away with it. The, the most they can charge is the Medicare fee. And interestingly, the Medicare fee is that sharply lower Mm -hmm. than the, uh, pri the fee that private insurance companies pay. For example, I mentioned the hip replacement. This is one of the most common uh, acts of uh, pieces of surgery in the United States for people over 50. And it really works. It's highly successful. People have terrible pain. They're limping. They're in a wheelchair. And you get this artificial hip, and they're up running again. It really works. Anyway, for a hip replacement in most of the United States, uh, Medicare pays about uh, nine to eleven thousand dollars for that procedure. Private insurers pay thirty-six thousand dollars for the same procedure in the same operating room by the same team uh, because the hospitals can get away with that. So um, we could, in fact, dictate prices. The most the most popular insurer in America, Medicare, does dictate prices. The hospitals hate it, they fight it, they complain about it, but every hospital in America takes Medicare. They still do the work for the lower fee, and then to, ride, to boost, boost up their profits, they gouge everybody who's not on Medicare for the same procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, in one state in the United States, the state of Maryland, they have a board that sets hospital fees uh, for, all, for every payer, for Medicare and for private insurers, and hospitals in Maryland are doing fine. They're, mm -hmm. they're not quite as profitable as hospitals in other states. But nobody's closing. In fact, they're opening new hospitals, even though they complain about it. So yes, prices should be and could be transparent. And prices should be dictated. There should be a standard price for medical procedures. That's what happens in, uh, in all the other countries. I don't know, as you saw in my movie, when we were in Japan uh, filming mm -hmm. I was in a doctor's office and I noticed that he had an MRI machine. He had an MRI machine and yeah. I was in his office. And just recently before that, I'm a snowboarder and I had fallen and kind of had an injury. 
mm-hmm. and went in for an MRI on my neck region. Mm-hmm. And the price in Denver, Colorado was 1250 bucks for that MRI. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I said to this doctor in Japan, uh, you see this in my movie, uh, hey, if I had a, a MRI scan of my neck region, what would it cost? And uh, he said, well, it would be Ichimayan, 10,000 yen, and that's, that's $96. So yeah. $96, the same thing in Denver, Colorado, cost 1200 bucks for exactly the same procedure. So I then went to an expert in Japan and said, how can they do this? How can they, how can they uh, you know, sell a $1,200 service for 96 bucks? And uh, the first thing he said was, well, the doctor still makes a little bit of profit on it. He can do it for less than 96 bucks. But the reason it's $96 is because the Japanese government set the price. Mm-hmm. And they said, Doc, if you want to do an MRI, you can charge $96. And guess what? The doctors still do it and they still make a little money. So here, too, the government could say to the labs, you can charge $96 for Reed's MRI of his neck, not $1,200. And they'd still do it. They would not shut down. But because we don't do that, you know, it's the Wild West. They can charge what they want. And they charge, by international standards, they charge outrageous fees to these services. Yeah. And um, not only medical tests, but I I know in the pharmaceutical industry, um, there's certain drugs that in America are far more expensive um, than other drug, this, than the same drug if it's purchased in another yeah. country. Yeah. And it's, um, the drug companies say it's for re- uh, research and development. Yeah. But when it comes to certain common drugs, um, I know epinephrine is uh, one of the drugs that falls in this. There's not a lot of research and development you can do on common drugs. And so when the price of drugs is expensive, it automatically drives the cost of other health, like the healthcare Absolutely. in general. Yeah. Uh, no, there's no question that Americans are getting gouged badly by the drug companies. Uh, as I say in my book, the same pill made in the same factory you can buy in Britain for 60 cents a pill, and in America it costs $28 a pill. The same pill in the same factory. And the reason is, all those other countries impose price restrictions on the drugs. You want to sell this pill in Britain, here's what you're going to get. And guess what? They still sell them because they can still make a profit at that fee. Uh, the way they raise their profits is by gouging Americans with the highest prices in the world. Um, why do we let them get away with that? Brits are rich. Uh, you know, the Japanese, their, their per capita income is about the same as ours, but they pay one twelfth as much for the same pill as we do. Um, why don't we say to the Brits and the Japanese, you pay $6 a pill and then we'll pay $6 a pill. Uh, and the reason is the drug companies can't get away with that in the other countries. The government won't let them charge that much. And so they make it up in the United States because the government doesn't put controls on drug prices. Um, now, the drug companies say, well, gee, if you cut our, our income, uh, we'd have to cut this valuable R&D, the R&D that produced a vaccine for COVID in just eight months. You know, How could we pay for R&D? But as a matter of fact, if you look at the spread at the balance sheet for any drug company, all of them spend two to three times as much on marketing, on TV commercials, et cetera, as they do on R&D. So why don't we have them cut their marketing instead of cutting R&D? They don't have to cut R&D. So there's there's no question the United States is getting badly gouged by um, the drug companies, and they can get away with it. And Mr. Costa, would you like to know why they can get away with that? The reason is they control Congress. They give huge political contribution to Congress and to government officials, and therefore uh, Congress doesn't crack down. The biggest buyer of drugs in the United States, the biggest single buyer of drugs is the Medicare program. Mm -hmm. Now, generally, if you're the biggest customer for a product, you should have a lot of power to to negotiate a good price, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm the biggest buyer. Here's what I'm going to pay you. But no, Congress passed a law saying yeah. that they cannot negotiate mm-hmm. the lowest prices, 
even though they're the biggest buyer and have a lot of negotiating clout. Why did they do that? It's because the drug companies, you know, they say they invest in R&D. Well, they do, but their biggest investment is political contributions. Mm -hmm. They have bought Congress. And uh, I say that in my book, too. And boy, they are furious about that. What do you mean we bought Congress? They did. They mm -hmm. did political contributions. And the result is they can charge Americans 15, 20 times what a Brit would pay for the same pill. Uh, this, too, ought to be fixed. And I think gradually it's going to start. I live in Colorado, uh, and we did a, something very interesting. Uh, in, in the, the price of insulin, you know, insulin is a drug that's been around for decades. Mm -hmm. It's a effective drug. I mean, it saves the lives of people with diabetes. Um, and even though it's an old drug and has not been improved, the price has gone up by a factor of 10 over the last 30 years or so. Um, so that uh, here in Colorado, people were being asked to pay people who actually need this drug were paying $300, $400 a month for this drug, this one drug. Um, and so our legislature passed a law saying nobody can be charged more than $100 a month for insulin. Uh, and this is saving people thousands of dollars a year. And guess what? Nobody stopped selling insulin in Colorado. They're still selling insulin at the hundred dollar mm -hmm. price, even though the price they tried to charge before was 400 bucks. So I, I think there's a lot of room for some kind of intervention to get American drug prices down. And if the drug companies then have to raise their prices in Germany, Britain, Switzerland, Japan, South Korea, to make up the difference, that's fine. That's what they ought to be doing. 